a Lisbon, the fast-moving and fabulous capital of Portugal. One of the oldest cities in the world, Lisbon is a place of mystery and intrigue. The ancients believed it was built over a cave of gold, guarded by the living dead. To the millions that walk its streets today, Lisbon is a rich beauty, a glistening pain to the past, present and future. But under our feet lies a Lisbon few have ever seen. Prehistoric dwellings, Roman catacombs, Muslim enclaves, priceless treasures left by those who have gone before. Which brings us here, to this church, the Church of the Most Blessed Sacrament in Lisbon's downtown Chiado district, where a venerable brotherhood guards one of Lisbon's best-kept secrets. A crypt full of mummies, dating back over 300 years. The incorruptible dead. Silent witnesses to centuries of history. Does this time capsule contain secrets from the ages? And does this crypt contain millions of dollars worth of gold and silver treasures hidden from the invading soldiers of Napoleon? This is the story of the secret mummies of Lisbon. For decades I have studied incorruption and the legends and phenomena associated with the cult of the so-called living dead. Now I have been called to assist in an extraordinary find. For centuries the Sacramento Church of Lisbon has been the subject of disturbing urban legends. One legend had it that dozens of mummies were concealed somewhere inside the church. Bodies that were presumed and corrupt, but that were not wrapped like Egyptian mummies. No, they were rumored to be miraculously mummified. But in fact, they were probably preserved through the process of natural mummification. There was just one problem. No living person could recall having ever seen these mummies. Yet still the rumors persisted. There were also rumors that large amounts of gold and silver had been stashed away among the bodies or even in the walls of the church to keep it from falling into the hands of invading armies. Other legends reported a more supernatural side, declaring that the body of a giant African king, the King of Congo, had been removed from his resting place to chase away French soldiers. Soldiers who attempted to steal the treasures that the church had hidden. But there was one problem. No one knew the resting place of the King of Congo or where the lost treasure was. But then there was an accidental breakthrough. In 1984, an electrician running wiring underneath the floorboards of the church discovered a door. The parish priest was called and the door was opened. What they found stunned them. My former archaeology professor, Humberto Nuno Oliveira, was among the first on the scene. What is being done now is important to history and the crypt of Sacramento is obviously one of the, those that came to our knowledge, probably there are others, and we have also 
um, the, the legend or the, the supposed idea that at Loreto Church there's also another crypt, uh, it's obviously important to know who those people were, uh, the period where burials were done there, which families were there, but obviously uh, we have to do a proper job and a proper work and a proper study of those bodies there that weren't possible until now. Twice, teams that had been hired to carry out the investigation were brought to a complete halt by strange occurrences. Many of the crew were afflicted with mysterious rashes and fevers. And then there were recurring nightmares, one so tormenting that workers wouldn't return to the crypt. The project was shut down and the crypt sealed and forgotten. Ten years later, when it was again accidentally rediscovered, a new assessment was made. But this intervention lasted only for a short time. In the midst of these excavations, the head archaeologist declared that he had found the body of the King of the Congo. But the next day, the parish priest was dead. He had died of natural causes. The mummy crypt research could easily have ended there, had it not been for chance. The new parish priest, Canon Armando Duarte, decided to carry out an internal investigation. Headed by a renowned New York forensic pathologist, CSI, Professor Dr. Frederick Zugabi. I was designated his assistant. Zugabi and I are both members of the Ancient Brotherhood, as is renowned filmmaker and mummy enthusiast Paul Perry. But sadly, Dr. Zugabi died, and so Paul Perry decided to reevaluate the project. After a long day of meetings, we decided to stroll the streets of Lisbon and discuss the story of the mysterious crypt. The church was built in the 17th century, destroyed by a horror of nature in the 18th century, and rebuilt only to be attacked by soldiers in the 19th century. And all the while, it held this crypt full of mummies that were protected by the ancient brotherhood. A brotherhood that refused to remove them even under the threat of incarceration by the government. In 1834, following a law of separation of church and state, all burials in church crypts and private chapels were prohibited. They were emptied of all human remains and these were buried in public cemeteries. Most of the crypts were then filled in with dirt or used for storage. But some crypts, however, like the one in the nearby Basilica of Our Lady of the Martyrs, were simply converted into shops. Believe it or not, the former crypt in the Basilica of the Martyrs is today a yogurt shop. Hi. Hello. Hi, is this for me? For you. Well, thank you. You're welcome. You have a nice place here. Thank you. Did you know that this used to be a crypt? No. Yes, it was a crypt until 1834, and hundreds of bodies were rotting here for centuries. What do you think of that? Uh, no, <laughs> and don't sleep in tonight. <laughs> Only some remains belonging to historic figures or special benefactors were salvaged and allowed to remain in the basilica. So how did the mummies in the sacramental crypt escape this fate? Well, the entrance was sealed off and hidden underneath the floorboards. Paul was fascinated and wanted to see more. So the next day, we went in to see Canon Armando Duarte, the judge of the Royal Brotherhood. Soon things took on a life of their own. Canon Duarte had discovered the crypt for himself in the course of restoring the church. I was brought in as an expert on holy relics.
The new intervention was to be supervised by another member of the Brotherhood, medical doctor and surgeon José Antonio de Cunha Coutinho. What we encountered was shocking. We literally found a mess. Following the previous expeditions, someone had destroyed many of the bodies with the application of quicklime acid. No one had any idea why someone had tried to destroy these mummies. Was it to have them removed from the church? Or was this a sacrilegious profanation brought about by superstitious beliefs, as I had encountered in many previous places? But what we initially saw in this quick examination made us think that the entire cache of mummies were partially destroyed. But Paul Perry saw it differently. It was certain that the crypt had been trashed by someone. But if several of the mummies were destroyed, then perhaps that meant that several were not. And if that was the case, there was still information to be gathered. Just going into this crypt was like going back in time in a time machine. We could see with our own eyes the people and clothing that walked the streets of Lisbon hundreds of years ago. And Canon Duarte wanted to let the curious explorers into the mummy crypt. He was proud of the crypt, and perhaps this new team could help him with a project of his own. As Canon Duarte pulled back the carpet to expose the crypt door, Paul Perry turned on his iPhone video and recorded his first descent into the crypt. Questions filled Paul's head as he filmed the macabre scene. Before long, he was hooked. This crypt was uh, casually discovered in 1996 when uh, restoration was being carried out in the church. And uh, since then, uh, City Hall uh, of Lisbon has um, provided a fund for the conservation of these um, uh, almost 80 remains that are down here. When the brief but poignant visit was ended, Paul proposed that a filming and excavation team be put together to do what no other team had been able to do before, unravel the mysteries of the mummy crypt. The year was 1685, and the Count of Valadares was about to save his country, or so he thought, from a terrible curse. For nearly five decades, the noblemen of Portugal had been building churches to counteract the curse that they believed had been put on them by Simão Pires de Solis, a Portuguese Jew accused of sacrilegiously stealing 33 hosts and stomping on them in the dirt in a vacant lot. Word of this desecration quickly swept the country and all of Europe. Solis was brought to court and quickly convicted of committing a direct physical attack on Jesus Christ. At the gallows, he insisted he was not guilty. Then, with clear eyes and anger in his voice, he asked God to punish the people of Lisbon for their cruel injustice. And he may have been right. On his deathbed, the judge on the case confessed that the condemnation of Solis had been forced on him by a powerful and unnamed nobleman who wanted to slander the Jews in general. The unjust execution of Solis gave the king concern that a curse may befall his kingdom. To avoid that, he ordered public acts of reparation to avoid God's retribution. Some people gave food and alms to the poor. Others, the wealthier members of society, gave far more. The act of reparation chosen by the Count of Valadares was to erect a magnificent church dedicated to the Most Blessed Sacrament. Completed in 1685, 
the church is deceivingly modest on the outside. Inside, it is a jewel box, one of Lisbon's finest works of church architecture. It is an artistic masterpiece, one that contains some of the finest murals, paintings, and statuary in all of Lisbon, all of which was built to create a heavenly realm, one that lies above the crypt where the Valadares family was destined to be buried. And it was down here that upon their passing, members of the Valadares would be laid to rest for centuries to come, all underneath the holy altar, where their mortal remains would be within earshot of the Mass. They would be united together in expectation of the resurrection of the dead at the end of the world. Actually, only one member of the Valadares family was proven to have been buried in the crypt before 1755, namely, Don Álvaro de Noronha Abranches, 5th Count of Valadares and perpetual judge of the Brotherhood. He died on May 27, 1752. All other members of the Valadares family were buried in their chapel in the Carmo Monastery next to their palace. No records exist to account for the other bodies buried in the crypt before the earthquake. Before going into the crypt, Paul decided to explore the church above ground. And as we did, we made a series of discoveries in and around the altar that added to the glory and mystery of this church. It was easy to go back in time and imagine what it was like when the church and the crypt beneath it was guarded by the Royal Brotherhood of the Most Blessed Sacrament, an organization specifically founded to give honor and protection to Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. Count Valadares built the church for many reasons and some personal. For example, the secret crypt was built especially for the Valadares family so that they could rest together in anticipation of the resurrection. But the spoken reason he built the church was for a show of force and devotion against those who might profane the Most Holy Eucharist, as had been done ten years before by Solis or by someone else who did not believe that the Eucharist was truly the body, blood, soul and divinity of the God-man Jesus Christ. In essence, it was the Brotherhood's duty to create a show of devotion and of force in the name of Christ. And the sacramental church was to be their holy fortress. To help speed up progress, Canon Duarte decided to close the church for one whole week in August so that the intervention could proceed unhampered. For one whole week, the intervention took place. For the first time, the team went into the crypt to plan their work. It would also be an opportunity for Canon Duarte to have the crypt cleaned before reopening the church that had just been completely restored. Most of the bodies were still contained in their coffins, but had been badly damaged due to the quicklime that had been dumped on them in recent times. Still, we couldn't know how bad it was until we got into the caskets and took a look for ourselves. We all had hopes, yet serious doubts. As we left the crypt, the massive task of sorting out, cleaning, and cataloging nearly 80 bodies settled on us. The bodies were in various states and conditions. It seemed like there was too much work to be done in too short a time, especially on such a fragile site.
It was our task now to identify all of these bodies in the crypt, separating the Valadares family from the members of the Brotherhood and the priests who were laid down below. It was a small crypt with many complications. The idea was to bring up the mummies one by one. That would allow them to be identified, for information to be gathered, DNA samples retrieved, so as to at least identify the Valadares family members in a lab at a later date. Some contained several skeletons, so many in fact that they spilled onto the ground. Then there were other features that demanded greater exploration. And remember, it was the Solis curse, the man falsely accused of attacking the body of Christ by sacrilegiously profaning the Holy Eucharist that led to the building of the sacramental church in the first place. And for a decade, the church didn't let the citizens of Lisbon forget that some kind of divine chastisement was well overdue. Many priests wrote sermons about the evils of the Lisbon lifestyle. They chastised women and men for not spending enough time in church. And all of this despite the fact that 60% of the working population worked directly or closely with the Catholic Church. But it was the way things happened on November 1st, 1755, the Feast of All Saints, that left many people thinking that these doomsday prophecies just might come true. At mid-morning, with the pews filled with worshippers, the jolt heard round the world took place. Earthquake! Roofs crumbled, streets buckled, thousands died in an instant, and even more perished in the surprising aftermath. For many, it was the end of the world. This is an engraving from the latter part of the 17th century, perhaps beginning of the 18th century, that shows Lisbon before the earthquake. The earthquake, tsunami, and fire of uh, November 1st of 1755 uh, hit Lisbon really hard, but the Sacramento area here uh, that you see, the parish, was really hard hit, and of the 3,000 people that uh, lived here, uh, only very few survived, and the many homes here, um, perhaps only a fraction of them were still left standing, or partially standing. The Church of Sacramento, of course, was completely uh, destroyed, and only the sacristy and the crypt survived. In the days leading up to the earthquake, there were warnings. Unfortunately, however, they only had meaning to the beholder after the horrible incident took place. The Consul of Hamburg, for example, Mr. Stokerler, wrote later that dense fog suddenly arose from the sea and he heard the sea rise with a prodigious roar. That took place the day before the quake. At about the same time, a fountain in the village of Kularis almost ran dry. This was seen as an omen. Fishermen on the coast pulled their boats higher on the shore because that evening the tide was two hours late. They suspected something bad would occur. A Lisbon physician named João Barbosa thought the atmosphere that afternoon had the appearance of clouds and notable obfuscation. For several days before the quake, farmers reported that their animals were tense and agitated. But the people who experienced these events didn't connect them to the quake until after it had happened. By then, 
These were warnings that had not been understood. The next day, Paul met with Isabel Cabral, a member of the Public Monuments Board, who took him to the viewpoint overlooking the area directly affected by the quake. It was here that she explained the new Lisbon. So we're, like, we're looking out over Lisbon right now, and I'm really curious to know what this place looked like the day after the, the earthquake and the tsunami in 1755. Ruins, only you should see ruins, because in the uh, uh, fire, the day after uh, the earthquake, fire, because during six days, almost five several historian, uh, historians and uh, others say uh, five days, firing all the city was in fire. During all the days, every, every built was uh, survived, that survived to the earthquake, finished with the fire. Why? What were the fires about? Because we have a lot of chapels, uh, churches, almost more than 60 church in the town. And it was the 1st November, the day, a special day, Christian day, to, um, a day of the Todos os Santos. And in this day, all the altars have um, uh, lights and candles. There isn't much left of 1755 Lisbon, but why would there be? The quake was the greatest seismic event recorded in Western Europe. Not only did it rank as high as nine on the Richter scale, it lasted as long as 10 minutes. Little survives from the period before the great quake. But what then happened to the Sacramento church and to the dead who had been interred in the crypt. We decided to take these questions to Professor Nuno Oliveira. All the churches have a potential of richness, no? Because uh, church things, church uh, rope, uh, vests, and everything on a church could be profitable if you sell them or if you loot it. So obviously, churches and also palaces and rich houses that were destroyed by the earthquake in Lisbon were a possibility of get their hand to reach things. It is probably the last big crypts in Lisbon with hundreds of mummies that are eagerly wanting to tell us their mysteries and their history and also part of the histories and mysteries of Lisbon. The most thrilling notion that we got from my old archaeology professor was that unexamined records might still exist in the Sacramento Church. After the interview was over, we immediately went to the church to see what we could find. What we discovered was a treasure trove of history, an entire archive with the records of the Sacramento Church. One of the first books we looked at contained an anonymous description of the earthquake. This is the most important book of the entire archive because it gives us an eyewitness account of the earthquake and tsunami of 1755. Another one contained a valuable list of items stored at the church to hide them from Napoleon's soldiers when they sacked the city in the early 1800s. This is, this is the book of the inventory of treasure. And this is book two. So it's dated August 22nd, 1806, signed by the parish priest, and describes all of the silver and gold and the vestments embroidered in gold. It was an amazing find for our team. One of the most valuable pieces of treasure described in this book is a three foot tall gold and silver monstrance. Now it was hidden during the French invasion of Lisbon uh, in the early part of the 1800s and was only rediscovered recently, walled up in a secret safe in the sacristy and is today still in use by the priests of this church. Now we knew what had been suspected all along, that a treasure of gold and silver was hidden somewhere in the church.
The question was, where? In a few hours, we had brought up the first remains of dozens of 18th and 19th century citizens of Lisbon. The thought was thrilling. This initial intervention would allow us to gather a wide variety of information that can later be examined by experts in a number of fields, from anthropology to medicine, even fashion. Yet despite the thrill of bringing the past alive, we found ourselves temporarily disturbed by what we were about to do. Stand face to face with the dead and seek their help to discover the secrets that they had taken with them to the grave. We were now face to face with history and it's the mixture of the two that makes it thrilling and frightening at the same time. Only a few hours before beginning our intervention, we were already thinking about the historical figures that we might meet, the questions we might have, and what they might say to us if they were alive. As we're opening up these coffins, um, I can't help but meditate on who these people were and how they lived, and that these are not just artifacts that are here, they're what's left, the human remains of uh, real life human beings that lived and stood and walked in the exact same places that we're, um, we're occupying right now, uh, carrying out this investigation. Paintings of many of the prominent members of the Brotherhood, possibly buried in the crypt, hang in the corridor today. One of them might well be one of the mummies that we find. The first mummy to be brought up from the crypt is that of a canon. Is it perhaps his handwriting that we read in many of the ledgers we found in the church attic? Or is he one of the priests who cataloged the gold and silver hidden in the church to protect it from the army of Napoleon? Could he tell us where the treasure is now hidden? This gentleman here uh, is a priest, uh, a typical 19th century, early 19th century, or mid 19th century um, priest. He's wearing uh, an ecclesiastical habit, what's left of it. There are crosses here which I believe have come from his stole. Uh, because the, the tassels from the stole are still intact. There is a rope uh, which shows that he was probably uh, buried in a habit that's very monastic-like. Uh, he's wearing the, the old Beretta that priests up until the Vatican II Council uh, wore. This is his Beretta and it's, um, it's very much the way Berettas are still made today, they've always been made this way pretty much since the 18th century. And what of a child who died of syphilis transmitted from her mother? We imagined how she must have tried in every way she could to save her baby, even giving her a poisonous injection of mercury to kill the lethal disease within her a treatment that caused malformations that are evident on the corpse. This poor child we examined was no more than two years old when she died. Results confirmed that this was the oldest known case of a child dying from congenital syphilis. This was, it had been acquired from the mother in the womb. Imagine what kind of emotional horror this mother experienced as she watched her daughter die. And what would she think of the godlike power of medicine today? And oh yes, the King of the Congo. He was a prince when he arrived from Africa to study at a Portuguese university. He became a King of the Congo when his father died and the title passed on to him but he refused to leave the cosmopolitan life he led in Lisbon and ended up staying here for the rest of his life. 
where he became a local celebrity, both amongst the court and amongst the African porters at the docks. We have a fairly large individual here um, with the upper torso um, partially preserved, partially preserved, and uh, it's a very, it was a very tall person by what uh, is left of the femur bones and uh, the foot is quite well preserved as are the hands and even the nails. Um, the head at first glance has an almost African look to it. It's hard to believe that before the 18th century, when everyone got buried in churches, Africans and Asians living in Europe got buried in mass graves, pits in the center of town known as Negro Wells. Well, before 1834, there were no public cemeteries. If you were Christian, you were buried right inside the church. Uh, in the case of non-Christian Africans, they were actually buried here at the end of this street uh, they were placed in a common grave, in a well. This street uh, is called the Street of the Well of the Negroes. And it was here that uh, non-Catholic, unbaptized uh, Africans were buried in a, a common grave. So a lot of the uh, people that wanted Christian burial joined uh, one of the brotherhoods of the city so that they could be buried inside the church. And this explains another macabre discovery. A dozen skulls that were tied to the interior sides of the coffin of the Congo King sometime in the 19th century. Together with the incorrupt body, they had served as a horrific prop to scare away the French soldiers. For the time being, the DNA tests are on hold for lack of samples from living relatives for comparison. So how can we know who these mummies were? Well, amidst the valuable church records kept after the earthquake in 1755, we discovered a burial register, so that at least the dead buried here are no longer anonymous. And what of the extra skulls discovered tied to the coffin boards of the alleged Congo King? They are probably what remains of the older burials in the crypt before the earthquake. They are what remains of the Valadares family. These bodies were looted and hacked to pieces by robbers in the days following the fires that ravaged Lisbon. And this, according to the eyewitness account of the aftermath written by a parish priest in 1760. And oh yes, the King of the Congo, when he died, his real legacy began. As a member of the Sacramento Brotherhood, he was allowed to be buried in the church crypt. But when Napoleonic soldiers attempted to steal the treasures from the church, his mummified body was brought out of the crypt and used to chase away the superstitious French soldiers. Frightened by the exotic mummy, they never returned to the church or district again. And the Congo King, well, he became an urban legend. At midnight, we brought up the first mummy from the crypt. It was the body of a priest, most likely a canon of the cathedral. Perhaps it was the renowned Dr. João Moura, beloved parish priest and monsignor of the patriarchal palace. He died on April 6, 1821. The unidentified portrait found in the hallway leading into the church could well be this man. Being perhaps the most revered member of the clergy to have served here, we decided to bring the painting into the room where the body was laid out. 
It was a reminder of what he perhaps looked like when he was alive. Bringing the painting and the body together was very disturbing for many members of the team and especially for Paul. As we looked at this mummified body before us, Paul was reminded of a quote from, of all people, rock singer David Bowie, who said, confront a corpse at least once. The absolute absence of life is the most disturbing and challenging confrontations you will ever have. And I guess we could say we were being challenged by what we saw. Look at his hand. Very well preserved. Look at the hand. I'll bet you anything his feet are also perfectly preserved. He's wearing socks. Somebody stole his shoes. Okay, this foot is not broken up, so we'll leave it. One foot's intact and one foot isn't. But soon the three of us found ourselves fascinated by the glimpse into the past brought to us by this exceptional mummy. In the end, this first mummy revealed much about the era in which he lived, his age, his health, and the social status he had enjoyed in life. This priest was a Monsignor and a canon of the cathedral. His vestments reveal that fact. They are identical to modern vestments of priests of the same rank. Even after 200 years in the crypt, they would look like new if they were dry cleaned. When toxology reports came back, it showed that he was not injected with mercury, a common chemical used to embalm bodies. Instead, the examination revealed that he had been disemboweled. This allows for decomposition to slow down, and after that, natural mummification can occur. His girth shows that he was a member of the upper class. He was critically obese and, according to Dr. Cunha Coutinho, most likely had gout. This was a sign of a very rich diet. Apparently, he lived well despite the constant civil uprisings that took place during his life between 1804 and 1830. It seems that he was obese, wasn't he? Yeah, he's one meter seventy exactly. He's, he's one, yeah. The doctor estimates he's about a meter seventy in height, and, and he is, in, in fact, we verified that he is. So the, these folds here uh, mm -hmm. sort of show that he, he, uh, he put on a lot of weight, didn't he? He was a heavy set man. So it, it appears to be the same, the same uh, man depicted in the portrait. What we can say at best is that this is perhaps Dr. João Moura, the first parish priest of the Sacramento Church after the earthquake, and the Monsignor that was buried in this crypt just before church burials were prohibited by the state. The illustrious Reverend Monsignor Father João Mourão died on March 28, 1821, and was parish priest of the church between 1804 and 1815. He was also a famed orator and chaplain of the royal house. For the time being, DNA tests are on hold for failure of samples for comparison. But the valuable church records we uncovered in the attic proved to be a fountain of knowledge, giving us for the first time a complete list of the names of all men, women and children buried in the crypt, so that at least they are no longer anonymous. The parish records also revealed that between 1872 in 1875, when the church was being restored, the crypt was cleaned and sealed up again. At that time, there were 72 coffins accounted for, and amongst the incorrupt bodies was that of Dr. João Mourão, 
who was still recognizable to many of the older parishioners, despite having died more than 40 years earlier. But how is it that mummies are created in the moist atmosphere of Lisbon? Nuno and I came up with a theory. The crypt is modeled after an Aztec drying chamber. As to my point of view, that crypt was done on purpose as a drying chamber because those uh, built, intentionally built um, structures we see there done on purpose suits that, suits that purpose properly. And if you have air coming in and going out, you can get actually a good natural mummification. The team had the crypt for only seven days, the time during which the coffins were being removed by the workmen for the last restoration works being carried out on the church. During this period of time, we collected DNA samples from all of the mummies, as the canon of the church had requested. The workmen then returned all of the mummies to their proper place in the crypt even though fragile coffins sometimes made it very difficult. In the end, the crypt was clean and samples collected from all of the mummies for future study of their DNA. But even into the seventh day, there was no sign of a treasure of gold and silver that some team members had expected to find. Then, late on the last day of the intervention, there's a possible break, as a workman finds an unexplored tunnel at the top of an arch. I was thrilled. We have a new discovery, folks, that um, <laughs> may change our, uh, our perspective on this. Uh, my worker here has just discovered that over this arch is what appears to be a chamber with a tunnel that leads a great distance back. I think we need a camera here, folks. But in the end, there was nothing down the mysterious tunnel, but unfulfilled hope and a fitting end to one of history's mysteries, the secret mummies of Lisbon. There's four meters. It goes four meters back, and then it's walled shut. Studies later showed that the tunnel was actually part of a desiccation system used to create mummies. But is the King of Congo really down there? And will we ever know the truth about the curse of the sacramental crypt? Those who came here before us allegedly experienced unexpected illnesses and even some madness. Will the same fate befall us? Is there truly a curse for those who open this storehouse of the dead? Or is this just popular superstition to keep us on the edge of our wits? All remains to be seen. One thing is sure, whether in our mind or in the physical world, the dead are always with us, always.